Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm William. This is the podcast where we talk about everything tabletop role-playing games. And today we are talking about the infernal machine of Lum the Mad. Hey Brian. Hey Will. <laughs> How you doing today? Well, what the hell is what the hell did you just say? <laughs> we got some wild shit to talk about in today's episode. Oh, I'm excited. And the infernal machine of Lum the Mad is is only like fifty percent of the madness. Thirty three percent, really. We got three artifacts on the today's yeah, episode. M- mad is in the title, so I better get a good dose of that. Indeed. Let's do it. But before we get into the the meat huh? and potatoes before. of the show. Okay. Uh, we got two things that we need to remind our audience about because we're really bad at reminding our audience about the cool things that we're doing. Oh, we're doing cool things. Like writing a book. We're writing a book. A sci-fi slash science fantasy 5th edition compatible D&D supplement book called Star Seeker's Guide to Dragon Star. Yeah, it's got a website. <laughs> it's got a website. It's got a, it's got a backer kit slash Kickstarter site. Uh, just yeah. go to drakenstar.com. That's D-R-A-K-E-N star.com. Um, to pre-order your book. We're working really hard on it. It's going to have all kinds of cool stuff. It's going to have uh, new species, uh, entirely new class options, subclasses, an entirely new class called the Machinist, over 100 alien monsters, a detailed galaxy, a custom species creator. We're working on all kinds of cool stuff for this book. And the art in it has just been so amazing as it's been coming in. Yeah, so, it really has been. Yeah, check out drakenstar.com. By the way, it is based off of our live play podcast, Super Quest Saga. So if you're familiar with that show and you liked the universe we ran it in, well, then check out this book because oh, this yeah. is going to give you the tools you need to run it in, in ways even deeper than how I did it because I was flying by the seat of my pants during that campaign. Yeah, so. and if you're <laughs> invested in the story of, of Super Quest Saga, you can check this book out for what's what happens in the future. It's exactly. canonical. It's it is, completely canonical. It is completely canonical. But you don't you don't need one to have the other. No. But they, it helps to have both, I, Indeed. I would say. Yeah. Indeed. What's that second thing, Will? The second thing is that we are giving away a copy of Baldur's Gate 3 for whatever system that the person who wins this has. Yeah. Um. In honor or in celebration of our 50K subscribers on YouTube. Yes, which, which we haven't gotten yet. No, we're getting but, close. But that's when we do the giveaway. We're on the hunt. We, yeah, when we get 50K, <laughs> you get a ball, somebody out there gets a Baldur's Gate 3. It could be you if you're a subscriber. It could be you. You have to subscribe, comment, and like a video, and you'll be entered to win. Yeah, that'll be it. Um, it doesn't matter what video, right? It does any, not matter. Any video. Any video. We're going to random gen all you fools out. Oh, also for drakenstar.com, be careful. So don't go to drakeandstar.com, like Drake the Rapper, because that link takes you to a picture of Drake the Rapper holding Luma from Super Mario Galaxy, and that's not going to get you a book. No, it's not. Drake As a matter of fact, Star. don't type anything. Just click the link in the description. You'll yeah, see it. Just go down there. You'll see it. Will, can we move away from plugs and do episodes? Yeah, stuff? let's actually talk about this infernal machine. Excellent. <clears throat> Hell yeah. Let's so do it. Here is a fact. I love those. It's the year of the artifact. That's absolutely true. <laughs> he was right. The year where we spend some extra time learning about the magic and wondrous items in the games we love so much. Excellent work. And today we have maybe the craziest artifact we have covered on the show thus far. The Infernal Machine of Lum the Mad. Yeah, I'm going to gauge everything about this against the Wand of Orcus. You should. Okay. That's all. Cool. It's all. You always have to measure things against the Wand of Orcus. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. Uh, bless your heart. <laughs> this artifact, like many of the artifacts we've covered this year, goes back to early D&D. It is detailed in the 1976's Eldritch Wizardry, and it also originates from the setting of Greyhawk. Love that. You know, I lo- I'm a big fan of Greyhawk. Castle I, Greyhawk and everything underneath before it. Before this year, uh, Greyhawk, I was ambivalent. Like, I knew it was like the original... You know, OD and D setting. I knew it was Gary Gygax's setting, and I knew it was super classic stuff. But the more I learn about it, the more I'm like, I want to know more about the setting. Yeah, Greyhawk's very. It's so it's cool. Deep. It's, it's and it's weird it's and it's cool awesome. And weird. Yeah. So as one would probably ascertain from the name, today's topic is going to center around the artifact's namesake, Lum the Mad. Mm-hmm. And Lum the Mad had a very, shall we say, active life. Okay. His story is tied up heavily in not just this artifact, but two others. Druniaz, the Claw of Theras Dune, Ooh. and the Mighty Servant of Luko. 
Okay. That's right. It's a three artifact for one episode. Oh, hell yeah. Bogo episode. <laughs> Both the Infernal Machine of Lum the Mad and the Mighty Servant of Luco have been statted out for 5th edition D&D, and we will, we will be going over these stat blocks. Druniath, unfortunately, has not been statted out for 5e, so we will only be going over the item's lore. Okay. But let's get into it, starting with the description of the Infernal Machine itself. I'm ready. Hit me with it. The Machine of Lum the Mad is an ancient artifact of mysterious design and unknown origins. The machine often appears from the outside as a siege tower of unnotable size, but this is merely a vessel hiding the true machine. The actual machine within the tower is a massive horseshoe-shaped contraption of levers, dials, and switches of various sizes, most of them obviously broken. Think of it almost like a flying saucer control deck. At the center of the deck is a crystalline box-shaped enclosure, large enough for four human-sized creatures to stand in comfortably. The device has over 60 levers, 40 dials, and 20 switches, but only about half still function. All of the delicate components uh, lead the machine to weighing about 5,500 pounds. That's 2,490 kilograms. <laughs> Indeed. Folks, <laughs> that we're, you're describing the TARDIS, kind of. Kind of, yeah. The machine of Lum the Mad has an extraordinary range of magical powers, including chain lightning, firestorm, meteor swarm, transmute, rock to mud, and more. The device has the ability to summer, summon planar creatures, including species never seen before. It can only be operated by a powerful mage of, with a genius intellect. Yeah, he knows not to touch. You have to be a genius to know not to touch all that broken shit. Indeed. Unfortunately, simply using the device is hazardous, with many of the powers it displays being dangerous and a real chance of catastrophic failure with each attempt. Combinations of lever pulls and switch pushes entered by the user can have either very beneficial or absolutely disastrous effects on them. There are over 8,908 settings possible on the device. However, its powers have faded with time. The machine's place and method of creation predate written history, and thus the machine was named after its first owner, Baron Lum the Mad of O'Earth. Man, that's a lot of settings. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. A lot. Yeah. So let's talk about the man, Lum the Mad. Baron Lum the Mad was a mighty Oerdian war warlord. He lived a life obsessed with war and conquest. In fact, he was trained for it from boyhood with a strict and brutal upbringing. Rewarded for cunning, logical, and orderly behavior, but punished for frivolous behavior. I cannot find further details, but it is said that his first experience with romantic love was a twisted, painful, and empty one. He eventually grew to be a handsome man with rugged features marred with only a few scars. And it was during his early adulthood that he discovered the sword Druniast, Druniast, an artifact <laughs> sacred to Theris Dune, god of eternal darkness, decay, entropy, malign knowledge, insanity, and the cold. Yeah. I, I remember the Theris Dune episode dropped when everybody thought that, I, I don't know where the line for spoilers is, but there was a lot of rumors that season two of Critical Role was going to introduce Theris Dune. Oh, as really? A bad guy. I don't know if they did or not. It was just like a root. That episode was so well. How very fourth edition of them. It got a lot of traction because of that too. Like it had a lot of extra plays for some reason. I didn't think Theris Dune is very interesting. Yeah, uh, I remember it being kind of cool. Yeah, and uh, Theris Dune is kind of like set up as a big, as one of the major big bads, big bads of fourth edition. Yeah, right? and one of like the OG beings of the of the universe. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, this is where we interrupt our scheduled program, The Infernal Machine of Lum the Mad, with a breaking report on the sword Druniast's claw of Theris Dune. Druniast a, is a magical bastard sword nicknamed the claw of Theris Dune and is one of the most powerful artifacts associated with that deity. Druniast exists solely to serve the dark god in spreading his worship and freeing him from his imprisonment. The sword serves as a type of window into the god's soul, and it is through this power that Theris Dune tries to obtain his freedom. That's cool. Mm -hmm. A little radio sword out there. <laughs> Druniath appears as a plain and simple bastard sword, but is forged from Ruinite, a mysterious purplish-black metal. Except for the strange patterns that appear to shift and whirl across both blade and guard, the weapon bears no other decoration. The blade of Drun Druniath is wider than most bastard swords and constantly emanates cold, Wisps of fog drift from the blade's surface in non-Arctic conditions. Cool. And the sword seems to drink in heat and light, both of which dim or lessen in its presence. Ooh. Rounded, thumbnail-sized knobs mark the ends of Druniath's guard. The sword's tang is, tang is wrapped in black tanned leather. 
Um, like that the might space be a... drink? <laughs> no, I know it's not that. I'm going to Google sword tang, though, and I hope it's not porn comes up. I'm pretty sure it's a typo. Oh, that's funny. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the handle, by the way. The round pommel of the sword twists and locks in place at the end of the tang. Which... Yeah, the tang is where you put your hand. <laughs> which hides in the, in the tang nut. <laughs> okay. All right. Journey ass acts as a plus five frost bastard sort of wounding. <laughs> a non-evil creature struck by the weapon can receive burning chills and impose two point. By the way, this is like this is probably pre second edition stuff that I'm reading here. Impose two point dexterity reduction and a negative four penalty on skill checks, ability checks, and attack rolls for one hour. Those wounded by the sword also are at risk of falling into a catatonic slumber for one to six weeks. Okay. The victim cannot be awakened during this time and suffers horrible nightmares and apocalyptic visions of their student's return. Oh, my God. I was going to say this is a super <laughs> ominous sword already, but now yeah. it's giving people nightmares. These visions haunt the victim for the rem remainder of their life, leaving them fatigued each morning upon awakening every morning until the effect is removed by a miracle or wish spell. Oh, my God. They get so, genjutsu so hard. That yeah. They fuck. They fuck them up it's it's a big deal and by the way plus five like that's a super big deal okay funnily enough due to the fact that the sword's goal is to spread the dark god's influence the wielder cannot use the weapon to harm or attack a victim sleeping under the blade's influence so if you don't die from the from the sword hit and you fall into that catatonic catatonic sleep well now you're safe from being hit again yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> I'll take it, I yeah. guess. Journey Ass corrupts any non-evil user to the cause of their Dune via empathic suggestions, the slow poisoning of the soul, and subtle nightmares. Roughly one to four weeks after the wielder first comes into contact with the blade, they become neutral evil. No saving throw. Oh, this, wow. You, you, you just, just become do. neutral evil. You just become dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> Alteration and alignment is both mental and moral, and the changed individual thoroughly relishes their new outlook. Wow. Only a miracle or wish can restore one's former alignment, but the affected individual has no desire to return to their previous alignment. Uh-huh. Drunias was created by the Doom Dreamers, Doom Dreamers of Theras Dune centuries ago from a secret metallic alloy no called Ruinite. The exact time and place of the source creation remains unknown. I like the um the leaning in on alignment here. That that's obviously a very like early edition thing, right? Yes. Like second Extremely, edition or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Where le your your alignment was your language, you spoke it. Yeah, we have like an echo of that in Five E, right? I know we've t <clears throat> we've talked about this before, but yeah, it's it's prominent in in Pathfinder Second Edition as well. Cool. Okay. Good to know. <clears throat> there's there's even a good and evil damage. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've seen and that. law and I believe lawful and chaotic damage too. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well. Baron Lum wielded his this sword during his conquest and did so specifically against the Urflane sorcerers of the Thelwood, but lost it during this fray. He spent the rest of his time on Earth searching for this blade, uh, the effort slowly driving him insane. Yeah, he never no one ever came by with a wish spell to like de fuck him up. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Years later, while exploring a castle that his armies had conquered, he came across the machine that would bear his name. A horseshoe-shaped nightmare of black metal festooned with levers, dials, sockets, wires, and plugs. Through trial and error, he learned to manipulate it, learning more about its functioning than even the wisest sages have since. If he was mad before, the blasphemous technology of the device drove him over the edge, but it also brought him great power. With his dis disciplined troops and his new powers, he carved out a mighty fiefdom. It is said that with the machine, he brought no fewer than 50 new species of monsters into the world. Oh, what an asshole. <laughs> I know. Okay. He thought nothing of barrages of fire that annihilated large numbers of his own troops so long as he carried the day. His reign was one of cruelty and horror. My God. Mm -hmm. So he's just teleporting bullshit into the world. Yeah, and machine. also fucking laser beams and all kinds of crazy shit. Hell yeah. Yeah. Lum's reign eventually approached its twilight when his formerly loyal subordinate, General Luco, dis discovered an artifact powerful enough to rival even Lum's machine, the mighty servant of Luco. And Luco found this artifact in an environmental anomaly known as the Belching Vortex that would also come to bear his name. 
Don't you okay. love Greyhawk? I love Greyhawk. Yeah, the belching <laughs> vortex. What the, a word. The belching vortex of Luco is a mysterious <laughs> location in the Hestmark Highlands. It appears as a black membrane set against a sheer cliff face, part of the mountain the dwarves call Vashal Tool. Okay. Occasionally, it belches out a toxic gas that can strip flesh from bones. The membrane is impenetrable even to magic and generally accessible only to those in possession of a small gray card known as the Secret of Passage, which must be held before a glowing panel to the right of the vortex known as the Eye of Aspersion. It's it's a spaceship. It's an alien spaceship. <laughs> those okay. who manage to create uh, to enter and can explore a metal cavern filled with strange artifacts of advanced quasi-magical technology. Portals to other worlds are said to be found within this toxic realm. This has some Lovecraft vibe all over Sure, it. yeah, yeah. Early D&D was weird like this. Oh, man, this is funny. <clears throat> it is said that long ago the Vortex was created by visitors from another world. It is also said that the local hill tribes that move near the Vortex interbreeded with the otherworldly visitors. Oh, no. The community... <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> The community declined, however, as its members succumbed to a wasting sickness, which symptoms included hair loss, nausea, fatigue, skin lesions, and dehydration. Hello, radiation. Um, the inhabitants of the community disappeared entirely eventually, and now only ruins of a strangely advanced community complete with running water remain. Man, that's like reminds me of how Spider-Man killed Mary Jane in that one storyline by Raw Dogginer. God, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid that the words you just said are canonically true. <laughs> It's so dumb that we live in a universe where that happened. Yep. <laughs> Moving it, it, it on. It did. <laughs> now the belching vortex is named for Luco, for he <laughs> entered it and emerged with his signature artifact, the Mighty Servant. Okay. We again interrupt our regularly programming to talk about a completely different artifact than the one this episode is named for, the Mighty Servant of Luco. <laughs> The Mighty Servant is a towering automaton composed of mysterious metals, crystal, and several unknown fibrous substances. Though reports vary, it is approximately nine feet tall, six feet wide, and six feet deep. Uh, that's some, uh, an amount of meters in all directions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> First and foremost, the Mighty Servant is a strong, tough instrument of war, immune to many forms of attack, and capable of regenerating itself when damaged. It is an effective siege weapon capable of demolishing castles and fortifications. The bewildering array of switches and levers in its interior, similar to those in the machine of Lum the Mad, are capable of wide a wide variety of effects. It's like three two two meters, right? Like that's what yeah, it yeah, be. It's, yeah, yeah, Some, somewhere in that ballpark. And also like, Lum, like Lum's machine, the Mighty Servant has some drawbacks to being used. It hungers endlessly for bloodshed and is capable of filling its user with an uncontrollable battle rage. Oh, cool. Their alignment slowly turning to chaotic neutral. One report claims the artifact is possessed by a demon. The Mighty Servant is relatively slow and clumsy, and there is said to be a self-destruct sequence within the artifact. So once Luko had his shiny new toy, he betrays Lum. The armies of Luko and Lum clashed many times, each ending in a stalemate, until a final battle in which a dimensional rift opened, rift opened, causing both warlords to disappear. The fate of Luko is unknown. Some believe the Mighty Servant was destroyed in that final battle, while others say it disappeared with its master through the dimensional rift. Lum ended up in the Plane of Limbo, where he has waited for centuries, his connection to the machine leaving him unable to die. Damn. And Limbo's, like, not a great no, place, No, Limbo right? kind of sucks, bro. Yeah. They're slotty there, and they're, they're, yeah, they're horrible. Yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah, and they're All terrible. All nasty frogs <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. abs. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh. The Mighty Servant is thought to have been created by the same unknown person or race who created Lum's machine. There's also a rumor that there is a setting within the machine of Lum the Mad that can initiate the self-destruct sequence within the Mighty Servant, though Lum himself never used it or possibly never found it. Okay. So the machine of Lum the Mad reappears in 5th edition in the Forgotten Realm. In the Forgotten Realms, of course, because everything 5e has to be Forgotten Realms. Uh -huh. In the adventure, Infernal Machine Rebuild. Now, I won't go into the spoilers of that adventure, but here is the background written at the adventure's very beginning. Did you want to read this? Yeah, sure. Eons ago, 
a planar craft of unknown origin crashed within the barrier peaks. The scholar Qualish would later find out that this craft, converting it into his laboratory and studying its technology to fuel his own experiments. However, Qualish was not the first explorer to do so. Earlier expeditions also chanced upon the crash site, and although most parties perished while delving through the craft, a few managed to recover rare objects never conceived by even the greatest minds of this world. Many of these objects were subsequently lost over time, and most resulted in the deaths of their owners along the way. But few persisted, controlled by those able to glean some partial understanding of their operation. Among the most important of these relics was a planar craft's central command console, used to guide its flight through space and time. Legend of this object grew as it fell into the hands of a warlord and came to be known as the most powerful artifact, the infernal machine of Lum the Mad, so named after its last owner. Yet with the defeat of Baron Lum, his infernal machines was said to have been destroyed as well. Currently, the Archdevil Zariel and Bell both have designs on rebuilding Lum's infernal machine. Zariel is present master of Avernus, the first layer of the Nine Hells. Bell is the deposed former master of that layer, but to rebuild the infernal machine, both devils require a number of missing components, former control buttons vital to the machine's operation. Zariel and Bell have both planted agents in into the world, tasking those agents with finding adventurers to track down and claim these components. Once the infernal machine of Lum the Mad is complete, whichever devil controls it plans to use the machine to claim final dominion over Avernus. So we got devils, we got the machine, we got... Thar's Dune. Thar's Dune. We got Forgotten Realms. And we then got Adventures. We Enter got Adventures. You. Yeah. It seems pretty cool. I don't know too much about this adventure module. I don't really run adventure modules. But I like the premise of this one. It's fun. You have Zariel and Bell. That's fun. I like yeah, I like is... both of them. That's one of the things for me about Zariel, Zariel and Bell is I like both of the Archdukes. Unfortunately, they hate each other. I know. Yeah, what are you going to do? But you don't know which one's going to win, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, and like how your adventure ends shapes the world, which is always fun. Yeah, that's a lot of fun, actually. So I'm before we get into the stats for the Mighty Servant of Luko and the Infernal Machine of Lum the Mad, let's take a short rest. Okay. All right. Turned. Did we have? We're fucking back. Indeed, we are. You know it. And you we know got... we're back. You can hear us talking. <laughs> it's done. Indeed. Ads. Forget you. Forget you listen to those. But do support our sponsors. But also, you could avoid those if you join our Patreon. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, it's true. <laughs> at, at a measly five dollars a month, you can get these episodes early and ad free. Mm -hmm. Pretty sweet. If you ask me, you can't stop us from plugging though. We That's do what true. we want. It's our show. Not gonna. Not gonna take more time to edit that out all right so <laughs> let's talk about the stat blocks for these awesome things we're going to start with the uh the infernal machine of lum the mad all righty um so we're just gonna skip all these lore bits because we already did that and we have let's see here uh silver wire the infernal machine's great size makes it largely immobile yeah it's more of a control center mm. yeah to make ongoing use of the machine such as, it reminds me of like a giant organ in like a church I like it. Yeah. You wouldn't move that, right? You'd no. have to disassemble it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Interesting. So, okay, well, sorry, I interrupted myself. <laughs> to, to make ongoing use of the machine, such as while adventuring, it can be connected to its attuned user by a silver wire, a supply of which can always be produced from the machine's inner workings. Whoa. The silver wire shares the same general nature as the silvery cord of an astral projection spell, connecting to the body of the user and trailing behind them. When so attached, the wire becomes invisible, astral, and extends to virtually infinite length. Oh, okay, so it's just a link. It's right. a wireless link. Yeah. And if you if you um if you hit if you you know battle with it, it'll be like, yeah. Stupid. <laughs> okay, so I, like, I, I tried to bail out of that joke halfway through, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. I was like, oh, no. 
As long as the wire remains intact, the attuned user can make full use of the Infernal Machine's powers with the effect centered around the user. If the wire is cut, something that can happen only when an effect specifically states that it can cut an astral projection silvery cord, the user suffers a sudden burst of feedback from the machine that kills oh. them instantly. Oh. They die. Oh, they die shit. instantly. The brain blast. Like, uh, like what's his face? Um, the whisper guy. No, fuck. Um, the Marvel guy that yells to kill people. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Sorry, I was looking at what cuts an astral cord. Oh, okay. Uh, who's the Marvel guy that, that the, blows people up by the, talking? Oh, Black Bolt. Oh, yeah. got spoilers for uh, Dr. Strange. Oh, sorry. It totally was. My bad. <laughs> it was. Oh, whoops. Okay, I'm, I'm looking this up because I'm so... Like, once you turn to an instant kill, I need to know what cuts an astral yeah. radiance cord. Okay, I'll, I'll um, keep going. Any effect of the Infernal Machine that requires concentration can be concentrated on by a remote user. The Infernal Machine's effects have a spell save DC of 14 or the attuned user's spell save DC, whichever is higher. And then, have you have you found your... No, not yet. Okay. Uh, summon Monster... Uh, when first used by Baron Lum, the Infernal Machine was known for its ability to unleash terrible monsters within the world. Specific combinations of its controls can still recreate the effects of various spells of the Conjuration School as follows. Day one, or once a day, you can conjure animals or summon lesser demons. Uh, one out of seven days, once for seven days, I guess. I don't know what that means. Okay. Conjure minor elementals, conjure woodland beings, summon greater demons, and then once a month you can... Okay, yeah. So once a day, once a week, and then once a month you can conjure elemental and conjure fey. Uh, and then you can also do a wish. You can do a wish good. Uh, the Infernal Machine has the ability to bend the nature of reality with the proper combination of controls recreating the effect of a wish spell, including all side effects. Due to the complex nature of its programming, this feature can be used only once per month. Each time this effect is used, there is a cumulative 10% chance of the infernal machine malfunctioning, necessitating seven Ooh. days worth of repairs and reprogramming, as well as the expenditure of 500 gold pieces in parts before it can be used again. When these repairs are done, the cumul cumulative, wow, it's hard to say, cumulative yeah. <laughs> chance of malfunction returns to 10%. Okay, real quick. The only thing I, I see here is uh, that is specifically able to cut astral projection cords is a Gith Yankee silver sword, which all Gith Yankee wield. So That's cool. Okay. That would be your if if you're fighting someone a BBEG who has this. That's probably super high on your list. Get a hold of a Gith Yankee silver sword. Sword. Although I think there's drawbacks to wielding one if you're not Gith Yankee. I'm gonna look that up. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Yeah. Random properties. There are far more possible combinations of the Infernal Machine's controls that can be ever that can ever be known or matrixed, especially as the controls shift position and reset themselves over time. At the end of each long rest, the user attuned to it takes the Infernal Machine re the Infernal Machine generates 1d4 plus 1 random beneficial properties and 1d4 plus 1 detrimental properties. Roll for each of these properties on the Infernal Machine properties table. To keep things interesting, the DM might roll secretly for detrimental properties, revealing those properties only during the course of play, which I think is fun. Once set, these properties last until the end of the attuned user's next long rest. Uh, I've started secretly rolling death saves for my players. Oh, really? That's, that is a lot of fun. No one knows what the fuck is going on. You can just like, <laughs> what do they look like? Are they okay? It's like, they're not breathing, man. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it's fun keeping secrets. Yeah, I like it. Um, once set, these properties last until the end of the attuned user's next long rest. Uh, let's see. Destroying the machine, which is an important part of every magic item. The infernal machine of Lum the Mad is self-repairing of anything short of catastrophic damage, and how it was disabled in Lum's time remains a mystery. It is rumored that if one specific combination of controls is set, the infernal machine will enter a repair mode, allowing unfettered access to its inner workings and preventing it from restoring itself if it is attacked. Alternatively, other combinations of controls might cause the Infernal Machine to teleport its most critical components to some hiding place deep in space and time, oh, shit. rendering it inoperable until those components are found again. Uh, and here is the uh, the D100 chart below. Yeah, let's roll on this bad boy. All right, let me do that shit. I got my D100 right here from last episode. I'm going to just, yeah. So all I, all I found on the Gith Yankee Silver Swords is that they're plus three great swords. They can cut the... 
astral projection cord, and that they can be attuned by creatures with psionic ability. Okay. Uh, I rolled an 85. So on an 85, you cast you can cast the healing word spell three times. Nice. That's pretty sick. That's pretty sweet. Also, undead are drawn to you. That's not sweet. <laughs> making That's it impossible enough. for you to hide from them. Each undead creature you face in combat has advantage on its first attack roll against you. That's wow. You know, undead undead means a lot of things. I mean, it means zombies first and foremost, but it means ghosts. Yeah. It means vampires. It yeah. means zombie beholders. Scarecrows. Yeah. No, are they undead? Are, no, I don't think scarecrows are undead. Are what? they? That was like a Halloween thing we did, right? Yeah, but I don't know if they're undead. Now Now you got me looking that up. Uh, what's the horse one? Uh, I know there's the nightmare, nightmare but what's no, the guy? Fiend. The guy. Dulahan? The Dulahan, yeah. That one, yeah, I think Dulahan's that one's undead. undead. I think so. Uh, either way, like, I want to suck your blood. I don't know why. I'm a vampire. <laughs> Bleh. <laughs> Bleh. Hey, you learned the heal, right? Bleh. <laughs> um, no, it's a construct. No, oh, Scarecrow is a construct. It's just um, like a hag toy, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think there's possession involved as strange. well. Maybe just because we did it for Halloween. I can see what you mean scary. because of the possession. And, you know, I could see undead being a thing, but it is considered construct, which makes sense. It is constructed. It is an artificial construct. So how many of these am I supposed to roll? One D4 plus one of these. Do you want me to roll more? Only if you want to. Uh, I'll roll one more just so we can get like some, some more context here. Um, oh, I stayed up in the 80s. 82 this time. Okay, so for You're 80, rolling like big numbers lately. Yes. Oh, God, this one has octopuses. All right. <laughs> uh, you grow gills. This is the positive one. So yeah. I read positive, then negative. So okay. you grow gills and have the ability to breathe air and water. You also sprout a pair of tentacles from your shoulders that have a reach of 10 feet and can be used to perform any action you can perform with your hands. Whoa. The tentacles cannot attack or grapple. Gross. It's you, gross, but positive. I guess. <laughs> uh, also, you are constantly followed by 1d4 octopi. I'm going to say octopi. Okay. That can breathe air and water and which have a walking speed of 30 feet. Oh, what? okay. They're, they're crazy supernatural octopi. They're octoproses. <laughs> <laughs> They're better at everything. Each time combat breaks out, you must succeed on a DC 13 wisdom animal handling check or have the octopuses, octopi panic and attack you. That is a crazy effect. So if they try to drown you, you're good because it can't anymore. Okay, so how did I, I was looking up get the Yankee Silver Sword stuff. You you get both effects. You get both a negative and positive when you were. You're supposed to roll a D4 plus one for mm -hmm. each. Okay, and when so do you I'm roll just, this? Um, when was it? I just read that shit. The end of each long rest if the user is attuned to it. Okay, holy shit. Okay, yeah. so this stuff is coming into play all the time. Yeah. So until let's, you die, I guess let's say the average would be like three. So we'll we'll do, sure. we'll do one more even. So you have gills. You smell really good to the undead. You got a couple extra spells. You summon some crazy land walking octopi that, <laughs> that, can, that like, sometimes tackle panic you. And attack you. Yeah, I would give them all. I would give them all crossbows for each of their. Arms. Oh my god! So here we go again. Glocktopi. <laughs> Glocktopi. Uh, all right. So fifty-four. What do you got? Oh, fifty-four. Uh, positive is while you take a short rest, the area within fifty feet of you takes on the illusory appearance of a beautiful forest glade. That's. And, Interesting. That's yeah, I guess that's positive. It's and, not but, negative. But the bad thing for that number is the first time an ally you can see takes damage as a result of failing a saving throw, you take the damage instead of them. So that's only negative if you're anybody who isn't like the designated tank of the party. It's only negative if that's not what you wanted all exactly, along. Exactly, yes. Yeah. That might be exactly what you wanted. Yeah, it could be, if depending <laughs> on how you built your character. I, I think that's it for this item. There isn't I mean, this tape. I mean, you know, some crazy shit. Yeah, we can't go through all. No, of them we're, on we're not going to read all two hundred of they, these things. They, they get wild. Let's let's read one hundred just for just to say. What oh, let's see. Okay. So, so all good. creatures of a particular type, other than humanoid, as chosen by the DM, are incapable of acting hostile toward you as long as you t do not attack them, threaten, or provoke them. Also, whenever you meet a creature of a particular type other than humanoid, as shows by the DM, there is a 1% cumul cumulative chance. That oh, the, cumulative? This is my greatest enemy right now, that word. <laughs> um, that the Tarask is magically summoned within one mile of you, but it no. won't attack you if you rolled the same on this. Tarask has no knowledge. So. Uh, I de like re realistically, you probably wouldn't roll 100 twice, right? For po Once for positive, once for negative. So this is not going to show up at the same time. Tarask no. can just show up by itself. 
is uh, magically summoned within a mile from you. The Tarrasque has no knowledge of your existence. It runs amok for 1d6 times 10 minutes, then magically returns to its so previous up to location. An hour. Up, yeah. to an hour. up to an hour. Up to an hour. I mean, that's a nightmare. Okay, so the 1% cumulative chance that uh, every time you meet a new anything, a die gets rolled. Yeah, and, and my Tarrasque is going to rampage for 40 minutes. Yeah. Within a mile from me. I mean, it'll probably take a while before this thing shows up. Because, like, okay, at first there's a 1% chance. So what you, you, it's like you roll a 100, it shows up. But 99 yeah. to 1 doesn't show up. Right, right, right. You run into, you get into a fight with five goblins. Okay, now there's a 6% chance. Still roll scary. Roll the die again, yeah. Still scary. But eventually you're in the 20, 30, 40% chance, and then if you're lucky you cross 50. But you know it's going to show up any time now. Yeah. Um, so crazy. you'll be ready. You'll yeah. be ready to hide. Yeah, like, seriously. Go into your like wall, your put up a wall of force or whatever. Yeah, or just refuse to meet new people. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a that's a valid plan. Like I, like how I do. Yeah, just or normally. like how I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So <clears throat> we have the next item here, which is the mighty servant of Luco. Um, so it has dangerous attunement. To oh, oh and I asked Will in the short rest because I was a little confused about what exactly this was. But he told me it's basically just a big mech. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which makes makes sense. It's kind of vibes I was getting anyway. All okay, right. So, uh, dangerous attunement. Two creatures can be attuned to the servant at a time, like a Jaeger. Like if a, a third Jaeger. creature tries to attune to it, nothing happens. Like a Jaeger. The, <laughs> the servant's controls are accessed by a hatch in its upper back, like, like a Jaeger, Jaeger. <laughs> which is easily open while there are no creatures attuned to the artifact. I suppose it's like a Jaeger. Yeah. Why not? Attuning to the artifact requires two hours, which can be undertaken as part of a long rest, during which time you must be inside the servant, interacting with its controls. Like a Jaeger. While crew members are attuning themselves, any creature or structure outside and within 50 feet of the servant has a 25% chance of being accidentally targeted by one of the Whoa. destructive fist attacks during the attunement. That's not like a Jaeger. <laughs> kind of not. Uh, this, pro this process must be undergone every time a creature attunes itself to the artifact. Uh, controlling the Jaeger. I mean the Surf. <laughs> while, while any damn it, attack on Titan. Eden Jaeger. Oh, sorry. Uh, while any creature, any creatures are attuned to the artifact. Attuned creatures can open the hatch and easily, as easily as any other door. Other creatures can open the hatch as an action with a successful DC 25 dexterity check oh, using thieves tools. Yeah, it's probably not going to happen. It's pretty high. It's really high. Uh, yeah. A knock spell can be cast on the hatch. To also open it until the start of the caster's next turn. That's well, the that's, easiest way in. Yeah, for sure. the, the, the disparity between those two methods. Knock is a level two spell. Yeah, yeah, and a DC twenty five dexterity no check with these tools. Oof. Knock is crazy powerful. Yeah, it it's is a crazy powerful spell. Yeah. Um, a creature can enter or exit through the hatch by spending ten feet of movement. Those inside the servant have total cover from effects uh, originating outside it. The controls within uh, within it allow creatures to see outside without obstruction. Like a Jaeger. Uh, while you are inside the servant, you can command it by using the controls. During your turn, for either attuned creature, you can command it in the following ways. Open or close the hatch. No action required once per turn. Move the servant up to its speed. No action required. As an action, you can command the servant to take one of the actions in the stat block or some other action. When a creature provokes an opportunity attack from the servant, you can use your reaction to command the servant to make a one destructive fist attack against the creature. Fist. <laughs> While there are no attuned creatures inside the servant, it is an inert object. Ghost in the machine. Upon his death, the soul of the mighty warlord Luko was drawn into the artifact oh, and has no. become its animating force. See, I didn't know this. <laughs> the, the servant has been known to attack or move on its own accord, particularly if doing so will cause destruction. Once every 24 hours, the servant, as the DM's discretion, at the DM's discretion, takes one action while uncrewed. If the servant loses half of its hit points or more, each creature attuned to it must succeed on a DC 20 wisdom saving throw or be charmed for 24 hours. While charmed in this way, the creature goes on a destructive spree, seeking to destroy structures and attack any unattuned creatures within sight of the servant, starting with those threatening the artifact, preferably using the servant if possible. Self-destruct, like a golem. <laughs> uh, by input or an electrode, by inputting a specific series of lever pulls and button presses, the servant's two crew members can cause it to explode. The self-destruct code is not revealed to crew members when they attune to the artifact. If the code is discovered, the DM determines how. It is. It requires two attuned crew members to be inside the servant and to spend their actions on three consecutive rounds performing Holy the command. Shit. 
Should the crew, it's a special dance. Should the crew members begin the process of entering the code, though uh, the servant uses its ghost in the machine property and turns the crew members against each other. It's like, you oh, shall okay. not dance. Yeah. You shall <laughs> capoeira against each other. <laughs> If the crew members successfully implement the code, at the end of the third round, the servant explodes. Every creature in a 100-foot radius sphere centered on the servant must make a DC 25 dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes 84 or 25 D6 force damage, 87, oh, 25 God. D6 lightning damage, and 87, 25 D6 thunder damage. On so a you success- die. Yeah. On a successful save, a creature takes half as much damage. Uh, objects and structures in the area take triple damage. Uh, tre- creatures inside the servant are slain instantly and leave behind no remains. So what you want is your barbarian who's in a rage to do the self-destruct sequence because they will, if they succeed on their save, they'll take quarter damage. And because they're raging, I don't think they can be charmed by the ghost of the machine effect. Uh, no, creatures inside the servant are slain instantly and leave behind no remains. Oh, well yeah. then okay. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe you want the barbarian to be the one, like if it's gonna explode, he'll be the one outside of it, yeah, like right there, because he's like he's the That's only where he's one who gonna be could anyway. survive it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, interesting, okay. Yeah, well. this does not destroy the servant permanently. By the way, damn. Uh, rather, two d six late, two d six days later, its parts: left arm, left leg, right arm, right leg, lower torso, and upper torso. That's an extra exodia piece. Dropped from the sky in random places within one thousand miles of the explosion. It brought within, if brought within five feet of one another, the pieces reconnect and reform the servant. What a fucking bitter self sacrifice. I know it's crazy. And then it comes back. But why would Luco ever destroy himself, allow himself to be destroyed? You know, I guess so. Luco's crazy. Uh, <laughs> destroying the servant. This uh, the servant can be destroyed in two ways. <laughs> not with the self destruct, which is not. It is That's not, only the first yeah. part of its destruction. Yeah. The servant can be destroyed in two ways. After it has self-destructed, its disconnected pieces can be melted down in one of the forged temples of its ancient almond creators. Alternatively, if the servant strikes the machine of Lum the Mad, both artifacts explode in an eruption that is three times the size and three times the damage as a servant's self-destruct property. Oh so you think that's God. what happened in that final fight between them is they finally got to each other, and when the machines struck each other, it caused that caused that dimensional uh, yeah, rift. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. I yeah. mean, like it didn't kill it forever because this is like a usable item now, that's, right? That's true. That's yeah, true. hard to take this one down. You got to melt that shit down. You got to melt that shit down. Mm-hmm. All right, I've got the mighty servant of Luco. is a huge construct. Its armor class is twenty two. Natty. It's got three hundred and ten HP. That's twenty seven D twelve plus one hundred and thirty five. Its speed is sixty. It has a plus ten to strength. Plus two to dex. speed on this motherfucker. Plus five to con. Plus minus five to intelligence. Plus two to wisdom. And plus zero to charisma. Saving throws are plus nine to wisdom. Plus seven charisma. Uh, it's got a plus nine perception. It resists piercing and slashing damage. It uh, is immune to acid, bludgeoning, cold fire, lightning, necrotic, poison, psychic, and radiant. God damn. Yeah, your barbarian's not even doing that much here. Condition immunities, all conditions, but invisible and prone. Senses, blind sight, 120 feet, passive perception, 19. Languages, understands the language of the creatures attuned to it, but can't speak. Uh, its challenge rating is not listed. Its proficiency bonus is plus seven. The cr- the servant uh, has, oh wait, has immutable existence. The servant is immune to any spell or effect that would alter its form or send it to another plane of existence. Damn. It also has magic resistant construction. This This thing's way scarier than the Tarrasque. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. Um, The Servant has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects, and spell attacks made against it have disadvantage. Uh, Regeneration. The Servant regains 10 HP at the start of its turn. If it is reduced to 0 HP, this trait doesn't function until an attuned creature spends 24 hours repairing the artifact or until the artifact is subjected to lightning damage. Oh, it recharges. Okay. Cool. Standing Leap. The servant's long jump is up to 50 feet, Holy crap. and its high jump is 25 feet with or without a running start. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, what do they call them? Like the pistons and its legs just work so good. Yeah. Uh, hydraulics, that's what it was. Unusual yeah. nature. The servant doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep. I mean, it is a robot. So. Yeah. And here are the act. It's a Jaeger. Here are the actions. <laughs> Destructive fist, uh, melee or ranged weapon attack, plus 17 to hit, reach of 10 feet, or range of 120 feet. Uh, one target, it's going to hit for 36 or 4d12 plus 10 force damage. If the target is an object, it takes triple damage. Um, so you can just fire one of these fists off into like 
the rain, the 120 feet. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, crushing leap. If the servant jumps at least 25 feet apart as a part of its movement, it can then use its action to land on its feet in a space that contains one or more other creatures. Each of those creatures is pushed to an unoccupied space within five feet of the servant and must make a DC 25 dexterity saving throw. And this construct is huge, so it takes up a three by three squ uh, square grid. Woo. On a failed save, a creature takes 26 4d12 bludgeoning damage and is knocked prone. On a success, a creature takes half damage and isn't knocked prone. Crazy stuff. Um, yeah, this is a this is a beastly artifact. Yeah, this is one of the strongest stat blocks I've ever read. I'm pretty sure, <laughs> and it's not even a monster. Yeah, it, it doesn't even have like doesn't even make people go crazy. I mean, it kind of makes people well, go sort crazy. of the the it users makes go right bloodthirsty crazy. Yeah, 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 but like it like the the menacing stare of some demon lords and stuff like that. Like, yeah, it's, it's not doing that. Yeah, it's seriously. just fucking with the user. Just wants to destroy. I don't think Asmo would like it very much if Bell or Zariel got their hands on. Well, they wanted they want the the Mad Machine. They don't want this one. Maybe right. Asmo yeah, has this better. one. Asmo's like, okay, I'll, let me bust out my mighty servant because this shit's getting scary. Yeah, Asmo could probably fight this thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a god, so yes, absolutely. He'll just boot kick it. Yeah, absolutely. He'll Get be out like of the, here. He'll be like the bad guy in the Jaeger movies, where the like Pacific Rim, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where it's like so insurmountable, but they like somehow manage to pull it off anyway. Yep. With like every last scrap of energy they have. Yeah. Those exactly. are fun movies. There they are. I've so, only seen the first one, but yeah. I saw the ending of the second one. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna watch the rest of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you needed. Yep. I'm good with I'm good with Idris Elba in the first one. So, so I'll just take that for what it is. Do you want to? Do you have anything to add to to either of these insane artifacts? No, I know. That's there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going. A lot on of here. lore. A lot of lore. That's that was really a lot cool. of mechanics. Yes. A lot of everything. Lots, lots, lots of end game stuff. This is all end game stuff. Which Welcome always, to the year of the artifacts. It's always fun to talk about Everyone. end game stuff. <sighs> yeah. Like a, the long Ve rest. Where's Vecna? Long rest. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Long Rest. This is the part of the episode where we just take we're just gonna take a break from all the crazy shit and do some peaceful stuff. <laughs> Indeed, let's do you it. I think, Will. <laughs> uh, I'm down. Uh, I want to yeah. start the top of this long rest by reading some some podcast reviews, some Apple podcast reviews. We've had a few roll in, and I wanted to catch these most recent ones um, and, and say a big thank you to you guys. Um, so I'll start with some older ones and move forward in time. Uh, we've got um, great resource for D and D and now Pathfinder 2E. This is a five star review. Thank you so much. Um, I'll get the username at the end if it's there. I only found this show a few months ago, but I love it so much. I've listened to almost all of the five year backlog already. <laughs> the hosts are informative and hilarious, a true delight to listen to. While most of their content is about D and D 5E, they also frequently discuss uh, previous versions of those editions. And and, and it yeah. goes it goes on from there. I'm I'm looking at like a snippet thing. I'd have to go to a different location to read the well, full thing I, but I, I can have them right here let me see here oh let me see if i can actually oh yeah there we go you got it yeah i got it All right. um they also fre frequently discuss previous versions of the topic of the day which is always interesting and now they've expanded to include pathfinder 2e which just opens up a whole new world to explore I enjoy it so much, and I became a Patreon supporter, which I hardly ever do. So thank you so much for the review. Um, Username yeah. definitely ish. Definitely ish. Thank yeah. you, definitely ish, yeah, for, for both podcasts. your patronage and your kind, kind words. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a bunch. I oh really yeah, we're appreciate we're it. reading all the June ones, huh? A lot of June ones came in. Yeah. Um, so the the next one is here. Uh, great podcast for veterans and new players alike. These guys are super knowledgeable, and no matter how long you have or have not been playing, you are bound to learn something. Keep up the great content. Love listening. That's from Frauk. Frauk. Thank you, Frauk. Thank you, Frauk. <laughs> we appreciate you. I love this one from Aheimer. We we reading that one? Um, let me uh, let me <laughs> let me check. I'm going to another another section here. Um, from no, uh, wait. Do I have one? No, I don't have one from Aheimer. 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 Yeah. yeah. You want to go for it? A Homer left on uh, June 12th, 2023. Best dick joke podcast out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think they also talk about RPG stuff. It's a great listen either way. Thank you, A Homer. A fair assessment of our recent <laughs> run of dungeon casting. Thank you. Uh, we got another one here from David Judith. Uh, fun and helpful. 
I'm planning on leveling up to DM, and this podcast has been essential. Our forever DM is excited to get a break and be a player. Every moment of downtime I have, I'm listening to this podcast. Thanks, Will and Brian. Thank you, David. And uh, I'm sure your DM thinks you, too. Having that break is really nice. So it it's is. really cool for yeah. you to do that. I got one from Hopscotch King. Uh, amazing, another five star. Amazing, amazing podcast. That's more than just facts. Huge backlog of D and D lore that makes it easy to get into the game. As a DM, this is invaluable for describing the world to my players. Thank you. Well, appreciate thank you, you Hopscotch, Hopscotch King. King. I'm you, terrible at Hopscotch. May you, you may your hops be true <laughs> and within the squares. <laughs> Looks uh, like we got two more. Yeah. Do you want to? I, I have the one from Fritz here. Okay, and I got one from Ben Little. Okay, why don't you read the one from Ben? Ben Little left on 6 2023. Great show. I really like this podcast. I've listened to every episode. I've been listening for years now and appreciate all the topics that these guys have covered in the time. I especially like how William brings his knowledge and lore from older editions of D&D. Keep it up, guys. You're doing great. I'm sure you two will read this, so I have to say I've noticed recently the two of you are really... Hard to hear. Oh, no. I've been hearing this lately, too. Oh, okay. That we're quiet. I don't know if you need to stick closer to your mics or what, but I have to turn the volume all the way up in my car, and I still have trouble hearing when you talk. Your ads are normal volume, and I don't have this problem with other podcasts. Just when either of you are talking, I have to be in a pretty quiet place. I don't know if anyone else has the same problem. Just want to say it where I knew you'd see it. Other than that, you guys are the best. Well, thanks, Ben Little. I'm I'm aware of the issue. It's actually been coming up a lot lately. Yeah, we've been hearing it from a couple different people, and I have been experimenting with different like softwares and stuff like that. So we'll we'll get we're gonna get that handled. You know, the funny thing is, I never have that problem. Me neither. On, in my car yeah. and on my TV. So yeah, I wonder what that's fine. about. It, yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag. Like some random people on YouTube have that problem as well. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it is speaker to speaker. It's something I can probably f- troubleshoot and figure out, so we don't have that problem moving forward. So yeah. I'll do my best there. I do I do the sound stuff for the show. Like the people that I go to for critique on the show don't have that issue either. So. Yeah, yeah, I um, don't, and I don't when I listen to on multiple things because yeah. you know I, I go and check it out, especially if a, a comment comes in. Yeah, audio can like, be kind of tricky. It, so, yeah. like different speakers do different things, but there's there's stuff I should be doing to kind of like mitigate that. So let me figure out what that is, and I'll take care of it. Um, and for our last one here, like we, we oh by the way, we really appreciate constructive feedback. Indeed, like I sometimes like, I, like, like what we just received. Yeah, like sometimes <laughs> I knock people on YouTube. It's not because they're critiquing us. It's because they're being legitimately jerky being jerks. strange. Like or that. Yeah. Yeah. Like <laughs> saying oh, off yeah. the wall things. Yeah, that, jer- like, jerky jerk stuff is different too. I don't. You know, it's yeah. easy to tell what's what. Yeah. Um, but like actual constructive critique is like something I really appreciate. So thank you for doing that. Um, when I st- uh, I got this one from Fritz. When I started listening to podcasts a few months ago, this was the D&D podcast I found, and I've been hard-pressed to find one that's half as good as this. I love the dynamic between Brian and Will. They bring a fun, uh, they bring a fun and flavor, fun and flavor to wonder, <laughs> that, they bring a fun and flavor to wonderfully in-depth discussions about a topic near and dear to my heart. I look forward to every episode, and it seriously is a show that sustains my brain through boring work days. Thanks a lot, guys, for being a beacon of joy for this hobby. Shout out to Dima Gorgon. Shout out to Shout Dima out Gorgon. To Gorgon. Thank you, Fritz. Very Thanks, kind Fritz. words, and I'm glad that we can help you get the boring through the boring work days. Boring work days suck. Yeah, we really appreciate everybody that took the time to review. Um, that that's that's awesome. It really it really helps the show. And now we can officially announce that we are now a part of the Realm Network. Yes, we are part of the Realm Network. We saw some t- of you saying, like, you got Dark Dice ads and know who Jeff Goldblum is, and so do we. <laughs> um, it's Dude. really cool to be a part of, like, we were with Blue Wire, and, and we're very appreciative of everything they did for us. Um, but they were, like, a sports-centered network. And I know a lot of people were getting, like, targeted ads that were, like, sports gambling and stuff like that. Like, not really fantasy stuff. So, hopefully now it's more th- thematical. Yeah, us. it should be a lot more, like, audio drama stuff, yeah. TTRPG stuff, fictional stuff, and history stuff. Yeah, so it's it's really awesome to be a part of a network that's sort of in our niche. And we really appreciate anybody that goes and checks out any stuff on the Realm Network. You know, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff there that I've checked out before. And it's an honor to be uh, associated with those kinds of creators. So. Indeed. Um, thanks for the warm welcome from the Realm team, and uh, we really appreciate everybody. I hope there was a flaw. I think it was a flawless transition. I don't think I, anybody really noticed except for the ads. Pretty smooth. Pretty yeah. smooth, yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, do we have – oh, yeah, let's go through the normal the normal long rest stuff. All Let me right. find my sheet here. <laughs> um, oh, wait. Where, where the fuck? I've got it. I've got it. We're, we got this. We got this. There it is. Okay. 
we uh we talked we had our patron episode last episode so if you checked out the random tables episode thanks um the next topic i'm sure is going to be voted on soon nominated and voted on soon it's been being voted on I can oh yeah okay sneak a peek if you want me yeah to. let's take a look all right um if you want to weigh in on what episode we cover next there's still time go to patreon.com slash the dungeon cast and there should be a little while left at least from the time yeah, this drops let me see yeah from the time this drops i'm gonna wait till the end of the week i usually wait till the beginning of the next month okay um and then yeah go to patreon.com slash the dungeon cast you can get episodes early and ad free uh, with a ton of other bonus content available, including live plays and episode notes and things of that nature. So we have here Demons Reigning Supreme as right now in the lead at 33%. Obox Ob, the Prince of Vermin. Ooh, hell yeah. Demon Lord episode? Indeed, but close behind it at 27%. So, you know, it's not final yet. Step-by-step -step dungeon building. Oh, wow. That's fun. So if you want to weigh in now uh, on this, you still have nine days. Get in there. Is that from episode release or the day we're recording? This? Oh, it's the day we're recording. Oh, yeah. But, okay. So By I think the time you've only got release, a couple days after yeah, this release. At most, it's one day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you don't have well, as much time there. as I thought. But if you go, you can you can definitely go vote on the next one. Indeed. Um, and Patreon people that are hearing this early, tell your friends if they want to get in and like throw a vote down that now's the time. Um. All right, so uh, we we read some Apple Podcast reviews. Thank you guys so much for doing that. I, I very much encourage people to continue to do that. It's one of the biggest things that you can do to help the show grow and reach new listeners. So thanks so much. Having a highly rated show is something we're super proud of. So Indeed. thanks a lot. We've got a merch store. Some of you know about it. Some of you buy stuff from there. It's pretty cool. Go check it out. There's a link in the description below along with all the other stuff we're talking about. Um, and you can follow us on Discord and Twitter. And also, uh, we are partnered with Diversity Saves. Diversity Saves is a 501c3 nonprofit organization created by a collection of BIPOC and LGBTQ plus members of the TTRPG community who are committed to the promotion and uplifting of marginalized communities in the tabletop role-playing game industry through promotion, education, and distribution of grants to help fund new projects led by marginalized creators. Uh, I highly recommend that you guys go and donate if you're looking for a good cause to support. It's run by a bunch of amazing people that we know personally, and I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for putting this together. It's a really cool thing that you're doing, and every chance I get, uh, I, I donate and drop some money in there, so I, I highly recommend you guys do the same. Um, very cool project. So uh, I think other than that, oh, we, we, we did talk about our giveaway, right? at the our we did march at, the, at the top at yeah the top, march yeah. short 50k uh leave a comment like subscribe on youtube you can get a copy of Baldur's gate also please go to drakenstar.com to check out the book that we're working on indeed and that's where we're going to call it again all right we'll talk to you guys later all right bye Dungeon Cast.